This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony. Anton Bruckner wrote his Fifth Symphony over several years, starting in 1874. He was 50 years old and was feeling very out of place in Vienna. Bruckner was an unsophisticated man from the Austrian countryside, totally lost in the political gamesmanship of Viennese musical life, and much too naive and insecure for his own good. When he began writing the symphony, he was in debt and afraid of going to prison. But by the time he finished, he had an appointment to teach at the conservatory, and 15 years later, he received an honorary doctorate. An amazing journey for a teacher's son with no formal musical schooling. Bruckner was so insecure as a composer that almost any comment from a critic, colleague, or student sent him back to his study for a rewrite. Still, by the time he began his Fifth Symphony, he was secure in his abilities as a writer of symphonic music. From Beethoven, he had learned about scale, preparation and suspense, mystery, and the ethical content of music. From Schubert, something about a specifically Austrian tone and much about harmony. And from Wagner, everything about a sense of slow tempo and a breadth of unfolding unique in instrumental music. The Bruckner sound was a combination of all these traits, but the vision was his own. The fifth is the only one of Bruckner's symphonies with a slow introduction. Plucked cellos and basses quietly tiptoe up and down the scale, while the violas and violins spread a soft blanket of suspended chords. disturbed three times by sighing accents. The full orchestra jumps in sharply. Another silence, and the brasses enter with the beginnings of a powerful hymn. Still more silence, then the sharp octaves return, and so does the hymn fragment. A new and quicker passage leads urgently to a fuller statement of the hymn, there is another sudden hush, and then the body of the Allegro kicks off with yet another melodic idea. No symphony ever opened like this, writes Robert Simpson in his book The Essence of Bruckner. Bruckner himself liked to call this his fantastic symphony, not in the sense of awesome or even magical, but it's full of so many disjointed ideas that it almost qualifies as a symphonic fantasy rather than as a symphony proper. And every new event in that opening flings us in a different harmonic direction. The first statement of the movement's unifying theme reminds us of the opening of Mahler's first symphony and its sounds of nature. By the time the Allegro gets fully underway, we've already been offered a huge variety of musical characters.
And after all of these episodes have come and gone, Bruckner's task is to establish the unity of all these themes. And the first movement unfolds as a great and dramatic struggle to bring everything safely and justly into its home key of B-flat major. The adagio opens with more plucked strings, pianissimo, the same sound as the first movement, but different notes. It is both a foreshadowing and then an accompaniment to a melancholy oboe solo. This oboe melody was the first idea that Bruckner put down on paper in February 1875. The contrasting theme for strings alone is both sumptuous and noble. The direction in the score is markig, meaning powerful, vigorous, pithy, a word derived from mark, which is German for marrow. Like the opening, this movement is full of ideas as well. Remember this clarinet line, it will take a leading role later on. The adagio rises to a high level of tension. but at its close, it collapses into fragments and in pathos with the return of the oboe. The scherzo begins with the same notes as the adagio, still pianissimo and again in strings, but four or five times as fast as before and bowed rather than plucked. This too turns out to be an accompaniment to a woodwind melody, similar in shape to the oboe at the end of the adagio, though not in mood. The central section of this movement may be Bruckner's only true musical joke. Its playful feeling is unique in his works, and the first notes the cellos and basses play form a parody of the scale segments that began the symphony. Each movement then begins like one of the others, either in sonority or in the actual choice of notes. The finale begins exactly as the first movement did, except for the return of the clarinet from the adagio, very softly dropping a falling octave into the texture, and the cuckoo call again recalls Mahler's first. When the strings come to the end of their opening music, they turn to the clarinet to ask, what was that you said? The clarinet tells them in a surprisingly cheeky tone. Bits of the first allegro and the adagio pass by, but the clarinets keep insisting. All right, say the strings, 
offering to turn the idea into a ferocious fugue. The fugue was one of Bruckner's favorite musical forms. His teacher used to get up every morning and compose a fugue just to clear his head. Here, Bruckner brings in a lyrical theme in the strings over a plucked walking bass line. Suddenly, the atmosphere changes. By now, we have some idea of Bruckner's sense of movement and space. The fugue and what follows it is all in preparation for another brass chorale. In reality, the first three movements have all been preparatory. After the chorale, the music begins to wind down in hesitations, silence, and suspense. The violas begin another fugue on the brass section's chorale tune. It begins quietly, but before long, the tide is irresistible and fierce. Bruckner's model here goes all the way back to two Beethoven works in the same key, the finale of the Hammerklavier Piano Sonata and the Great Fugue for String Quartet. The last word, though, belongs to the brass, as a final appearance of the chorale resolves the argument. Bruckner never heard this symphony performed by a full orchestra. The premiere in 1894 was in a heavily edited and reorchestrated version by one of his associates, written without his approval. His own original version wasn't performed until 1935. Anton Bruckner was a deeply religious man who spent his life creating cathedrals of sound. For him to pull together the disparate elements of his Fifth Symphony with a hymn may have been the most heartfelt statement of faith he ever made. This is Rick Malone for the San Francisco Symphony.